Okay, so what we call the interwar era is the period that, you know, World War One ends uh, November 11, 1918. Um, and the, the, the framework that the College Board gives us is that uh, after World War One ended, there was an intensified debate about what was America's role. So some historians see this as America emerged from World War One as sort of like a superpower, but we didn't want that role. And so after World War One, we um, we sort of retreated back to isolationism and uh, you know, sort of legislative neutrality, and that is going to keep America out of the sort of developments that lead to World War Two. But uh, many critics of this say that ultimately we'll still be drawn into World War Two, and we'll be unprepared. And for a sense of context, after World War Two ends, Harry Truman is really concerned that we're going to go right back to the pattern we did in 1919, which is to adopt neutrality again, or more isolationism, and that would have left us not in a position to be rivals to uh, the Soviet Union. So, you know, the, the framework points out here that we were initially neutral in the Ultimately, we entered it, uh, departing from our tradition of non-involvement, but, but really in response to Wilson's call for, you know, making the world safe for democracy and ending all wars. Didn't do a whole lot of fighting in it, but definitely helped win, the Allies win. Uh, even though Wilson is going to negotiate the uh, Treaty of Versailles, we, we know that Henry Cabot Lodge and other Republicans, particularly the Irreconcilables, are going to refuse to take it and, and, and ratify it. Plus, we don't join the League of Nations. And so this unit today, this topical unit, is really about how America pursued unilateral, that means one-sided. Years after World War I, we by ourselves you know, pursued our own foreign policy using investments. You'll see that there in the Harding through Hoover administration. Some treaties, things like the Calabrian Pact, and very small military intervention, think Latin America, while maintaining isolationism. And then in the 30s, uh, you know, the roaring 20s have ended, um, and we're still in the Depression, but we're now concerned about the rise of various fascist and totalitarian leaders, particularly the Nazis and in Japan, because of our role in the Pacific. So uh, just to remind you that the, the, the administration uh, in Washington throughout the 20s were Republicans who had, starting with Harding, promised a return to normalcy. They were rejecting progressivism uh, overall and saying that, Okay, progressivism is far too uh, intrusive into the business world, and and really, you know, instead of interfering with business, we're going to, they said, help business. Um, most notably, President Harding, we talked about his personality. It's not going to be an AP topic, but he can be a decent fellow who makes some terrible mistakes of judgment of people. Um, he surrounds himself with guys that were sort of cronies from Ohio. Now, these men weren't really his cronies. I, I don't want to imply that. These were actually the Republican luminaries, the, the big stars of the Republican Party. They're going to get the good job, so to speak, of state, treasury, and commerce. Uh, then we have a very infamous Secretary of the Interior and an absolutely downright uh, criminal Attorney General. So a, a mixture of good and bad here. And so just a reminder that, you know, Harding and Coolidge, again, really were not just laissez faire, they actively pursued deregulation and opposition to antitrust law. Some would see similarities with President Trump today in this sort of government less regulation, deregulatory, it's certainly wrong with Reagan too. Uh, so typically much more pro-business environment, Supreme Court see some real changes during this period, uh, at least a couple, um, and under under then Chief Justice Taft. Uh, and at this point, you know, you start to see that uh, that really labor and, and business are at real odds and, and business is going to be able to use the Red Scare to benefit from that. Talked about veterans are going to begin to play a major role in voting, also seeing benefits for veterans in terms of uh, an attempt to expand pensions to veterans. Both of both presidents, Harding and Coolidge, vetoed this as sort of federal waste, but it was passed over their vetoes. So, you know, veterans would continue to be a core constituency of the Republican Party for voters. Uh, and have been there ever since. Um, finally, we get around to end in World War One in 1921, not through a treaty. Basically, the U.S. Had never entered a treaty, and, and we never left with a treaty. We just agreed that the war ended. Uh, and we do watch the League of Nations. We monitor it, but we don't participate in it. Don't vote. Don't uh, you know? Don't serve as a member. Meanwhile, 
while we are relatively isolationist in terms of foreign policy, not in terms of economic policy, meaning uh, American businesses sort of are, are encouraged to go abroad to find resources to further our, our economic needs, uh, very not only pro-business administration, but pro-business foreign policy. This is not dollar diplomacy. This is not philosophically inclined to using businesses to try to promote democracy, but it is using businesses to extract resources like in the Middle East for, uh, for the Exxon Corporation in, in Iraq and in Turkey. Uh, so there were some agreements mentioned in, in that uh, outline. You have this very famous Washington Naval Conference, the Washington Disarmament Conference. Uh, and certainly you can see since we hosted it, we didn't mind participating. Um, and the goal was to reduce the amount of weapons. Military had said it called World War II. So you see here, we, we negotiated a treaty with the five world naval powers. Um, and, and we'd stop making heavy warships, heavy ships like battleships. Now, keep in mind, aircraft carriers haven't quite taken off yet as a concept. So this was a, a, a will, willingly reduction in militarism. Unfortunately, it had some major loopholes. And like all the agreements of this period, no mechanism to actually enforce it. Um, and, and another element of Republicans uh, historically is that they are protectionist. Uh, President Trump, certainly no exception today, uh, using tariffs as a means to encourage American domestic consumption. Uh, buying stuff in America from Americans will be good for American businesses. So the argument goes. Uh, and so you have the first major tariff of the 20s, which is the Forty McCumber tariff, all right, which takes us back to the old Republican tariff of the uh, 1890s. Uh, and then, of course, we have another tariff coming in about 10 years, the Holly Smoot tariff. Uh, the, the hallmark of all these increased tariffs is that whenever we raise tariffs on some country, they're going to raise tariffs back on us. Uh, and you see here that the ability of the president personally to raise and lower tariffs, this is going to continue under President Roosevelt to the president, to the present president. Uh, they can personally raise or lower tariffs without a congressional act enactment. Um, so Harding's presidency is overwhelmingly historically associated with corruption. Uh, that's not completely fair, obviously. Uh, if you think about Secretary Mellon, not really a corrupt man, uh, Secretary of State Hughes. But in terms of the two that I mentioned earlier, Fall and Doherty, Fall is the individual who leases um, you know, American oil to sort of his Navy buddies, not Navy buddies, excuse me, uh, shipping buddies. And they'll use the oil that's supposed to go to the Navy. And this is called Teapot Dome, named after the sort of shape of where this place is located. Uh, and then. General Attorney General Doherty actually accepts like bribes in order to uh, thwart prohibition from some uh, bootlegger types, really illegal activity. So Harding associated with corruption. Uh, Coolidge, you know, sort of famously quiet, silent cow, um, and, and really probably the most pro-business president we've ever had. Uh, you can see language like the business of America is business, the factory is a temple, uh, and really you know, an example of a truly hands-off president. Um, so what happened to lead us to the Depression is interesting to me because the Depression kind of actually starts in the 20s with the farmers. Uh, we're talking about the American farmer of the West and the Midwest. Uh, and, and what they see is is that after World War One ends, you know, during World War I, um, we, we see a lot more farmers uh, able to export their goods. Uh, as you can see here, this sort of increase in exports. But right after World War I, you see a decline with a small you know, jump there and an even more decline, steeper decline. So what happened was they were growing a lot of crops during the war to sell to European markets. And after the war, the Europeans could grow their own food. Uh, but really the hallmark of the 20s is if you think about the roaring 20s, all that technological innovation is developing new machinery. And new machinery means increased efficiency, which means more productivity. But it also means you don't need as many workers because if, you know, the machines are replacing the workers to get stuff done. We're living in that era right now. You know, we haven't figured out what people are going to do next post machines. Um, so what you see happen is, is that farmers, which have never really made much money to begin with, go back to the populace, uh, couldn't pay back their loans and they were getting foreclosed on or repossessed just like normal. Uh, there was a bill that was vetoed but it, you know, by Coolidge, but it was proposed to have actually had the government purchase the surpluses that uh, that these farmers um, you know, are creating uh, today. And, you know, President Trump has, has said that he would use the Emergency Act to 
formally keep meat packing industries open if, if the meat supply stopped stop working. You see farmers suck really badly because they can't sell the produce they grew for this year. Uh, and so the, the ideal scenario under a Keynesian mindset would be let the government buy up the surpluses, uh, but that's not the attitude of the 1920s uh, political leaders. And so that's a farm foreclosure, an auction, and really farmers are going out of business even before the Dust Bowl hit. Uh, so in, in comes an election. Um, this is a period in history in the 20s when the Republicans have real dominance. Uh, and so the Dems, in essence, nominate a, a sort of similar leader, a conservative corporate lawyer. That's, you know, really, you can choose between a pro-business leader or a pro-business leader, uh, fairly both conservative. So this is a chance for the progressive. But unfortunately for Fighting Bob, there really wasn't enough progressive movement around the country. TR had never really created a national progressive party he could run as well himself. So La Follette was not able to sort of capitalize on progressives throughout the country. Uh, and would finish, as you see, a distant third on his home state. Coolidge wins outright. You know, that he was vice president who had become president uh, after the death of Harding. He, he gets elected and business continues. Now, the, the outline that was given by the framework said, you know, there were some times when we intervened uh, or went abroad for weapons. And the answer to that is always going to be Latin America. Uh, Coolidge continues our policy of intervening in Latin America. They date back to the Roosevelt Corps. You know, the idea that we're going to intervene down there to keep the peace so that Europe didn't have to come over. Meanwhile, Europe is, is really hurting because they owe, particularly the Allies, who are here, the Blues are the Allies during World War One. The Allies owed us a lot of money, and I mean a lot of money. This is part of the pressure that the French had placed, had been on the French to demand money from Germany through the reparations program. So there was an, an, a request by these European countries who really couldn't get out from under this debt and say, hey, how about we don't pay it back? And, and Coolidge utterly rejects that. He's like, no, you're going to you're going to pay the money back. <laughs> you know, now, Russia said, forget it. We're not paying that money back. But uh, pretty much he tells everybody. And the only country that manages to pull that off is, uh, as, as you might recall, is Finland. Everybody else is ultimately just going to not pay this back in 1931. There's no more option to pay. So it's during this interwar period, the 20s, that this new government of Germany comes out, the Weimar government, and the economy is in utter shambles. They, they, their major industrial uh, part of the, of the country is not producing goods for themselves. Any raw gold or silver back money is being sent over to Britain or France for reparations. So Germany is in, is in dire straits. Their democracy is, is not, is not look like it's going to be successful, and we step in with the, something called the Dahls Plan. In 1924, the Dawes Plan says, how about we loan you money, Germany, and then you can use that money, some of it, as you can see, there's about half a billion left for you, to pay back the Allies, well, then pay us back. So if you think about this from a Calvin Coolidge perspective, th this is terrific. You know, we're going to get double money. We're going to get money that was owed to us from the Allies, and heck, the Germans are going to pay us back, too. So it's like getting you know, double dipping here. This is going to work for a brief period, uh, you know, and then the Depression's going to hit, and and the whole thing's going to fall apart. So it might have worked had it not been for the Depression, but that's one of those we'll never know. Now, in the meantime, we're negotiating more of these treaties to try to prevent future wars. So I think the Washington Naval Treaty. Now comes the so-called Kellogg-Briand Pact. It's a beautiful philosophical treaty, although completely ludicrous, in, in, I think, in reality. 62 countries agree to never uh, wage war again. Uh, as, a, as a form of policy. So we're never going to actually fight ever again. And of course, France signs off on this, and Germany signs off on this, America signs off on this, Japan signs on So no one's actually going to actually do it. But it, we sure do feel good about ourselves for negotiating the kellogg Briand Pact. Okay? And so in comes uh, election 1928. This is an absolutely devastating victory uh, for the Republicans, for Herbert Hoover. Hoover had been the Secretary of Commerce. He was probably the, the one of the most ideal candidates we've ever had for president. He was, uh, you know, rags to riches, came up from orphanage status. He'd been all around the world. He'd done the relief of Belgium in World War One. He ran the Food Administration, and he'd been very effective uh, in his role as Commerce Secretary. You could see the Dems, even, I guess you could say, uh, take one more blunder, although, you know, Al Smith was certainly a, a decent, honorable man. He, he had been governor of New York, four times, but he he sounded like I knew y'all. He, uh, he was pro-alcohol. That's why he's called a wet. You know, he's anti-prohibition. Uh, he was from New York City, and he was Catholic, which meant down here, 
uh, that was just a little too much to bear. Now, the Deep South, keep in mind, for the Deep South, the Republican Party is the, repart- is the party of Lincoln, and they're never going to vote for him, they say. So no matter what, these six states still voting Democrat, even though this fella has virtually nothing in common with them. Uh, but, you, you know, it's, it's a... It's a period where the Democratic Party was so solid in these states, it, it, it just wasn't going to break through, even with this. But uh, Hoover does really well, gets elected comfortably. Now, during the 20s, I would point out that organized labor does not get its normal, what you would expect, recovery. I, you know, if you think about after war is over, you, you would think workers would be able to uh, you know, now finally advocate for better wages. The problem is, is that, you know, you got returning soldiers who want those jobs back. Plus, uh, during the interwar period, um, you, you've got the idea that uh, organized labor is associated with communism. So you can see you know, there's red scare going on. So labor unions don't make gains in the 20s. You've got a, a business, pro-business-minded um, uh, administrations. And then the other group that really doesn't make much success is our, our farmers. Keep in mind, they're still fairly disorganized. The populists have now faded 30 years into the history books. And, and so they do secure, ultimately, under Hoover, the Federal Farm Board, which allows them to borrow money from the government to actually create surplus storage facilities. So this is a, it's a small step. It's not huge, but it, it's progress. But all of it's going to literally come crashing to a halt uh, in 1929, in October. So, you know, this is 10, 29, 29, Black Tuesday. You had another crash uh, repeatedly that week. The, the market continued to drop. Uh, you can see here it, it just plummets. Um, and this depression, uh, as it's called, the Great Depression, is going to last until we commence fighting in World War II, 1942. So this really the entire decade of the 1930s. So if you hear 1930s, you're thinking the Great Depression. That's this period. Um, and it's triggered, but it's not singularly caused by a stock market dip. Stock market dips occur quite often, and throughout most of history, uh, very few people were invested in the stock market, so it didn't seem like that would have been a big deal. But things have changed dramatically in the 20s uh, as, a, as, a, as a cause of this. Now, there are a lot of factors besides over, uh, over purchasing of stocks. Farms and factories were running high surpluses. They, they were really producing far more than they could sell domestically. So when the fact that we had high tariffs, you can't unload this, and, and, and and how price, how wages and prices are connected. Uh, no wage increases. So you know, I know people don't like to hear about increases in the uh, minimum wage and stuff like that. But if 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 purchasing power does not increase over time, then the economy doesn't really grow. Uh, you can't grow the economy for a very small percentage of the people and expect success for everyone that way. Uh, history shows. People were able to borrow money, though, and thus maintain a sort of lifestyle that was not realistic to their income. Uh, and credit was readily available, and many, many people were deeply in debt, either to banks uh, or to you know, uh, someone who owned an asset that they had been borrowed against, like a stock on margin. Uh, technological unemployment was probably one of the underlying causes of the Depression that was really unavoidable without the replacement of new innovation that did not exist. So in other words, when you build an assembly line like Henry Ford that is so useful, sure, you need workers, but you don't need as many workers as you used to. Uh, and, and you're producing even more cars and not selling them abroad. So this is this is a problem, and we're probably going to live with this ourselves uh, in our lifetime, through our lifetime. Uh, bank failures in Europe particularly, but also... In pla- you know, in places like London and Paris, but even here, you know, you're going to start seeing American banks get pulled down with them. I've already mentioned high tariffs. They'll continue to grow. Bad idea. And then, of course, at the Dust Bowl out in the West, and, and, and all of this leads to a collapse. So just a reminder about the stock market. This is security over there. You buy stocks that are traded publicly. You do this in exchange for a profit, hopefully, over time. However, some investors want to get rich quick and by only borrowing 10 percent of the full value you could buy your stock sell it later pay off the little bit that you borrowed and come out with a tidy profit so it was actually borrowing to invest and they didn't view it as a risk they viewed it as a smart investment now buying on margin is risky because if you know if you're not able to pay back the debt 
uh, then you lose the asset. Plus, you still have to pay the interest that you borrowed. And this is what I, I've mentioned before. Most of the time in history, few people were invested in the stock market. Well, this was a different period because you didn't have to put that much money down. A whole lot of investors were invested in the stock market. Today, a lot of Americans are still in, or even more they're invested in the stock market because now our retirement accounts, our pension plans are are invested in the stock market. But that's usually not requiring us to borrow anything. It's usually actually an investment by our, our employers. So speculative bubble, always the cause of depression or recession, speculation, the hope that you could buy and sell quickly. Keyword here is quickly. Thus, you're trying to, in the words of one, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, act irrationally exuberant, uh, meaning you're, you're just getting carried away here in the hope for a quick return because of someone else's stories. And the newspapers were filled with sort of rags to riches overnight stories. Like if you bought GE at 130 within a matter of days, you could flip it for 396. That's an extraordinary amount of growth, three times the rate, you know, 300 percent increase. So this this meant that if you were trying this quick and succeeding, it worked. But for the normal investor, long term is the way it's historically done, because, you know, this was a retirement plan or a long term investment plan. Today, we're, we're sort of back to that. But, you know, these folks are speculators. They're not uh, investors long term. Uh, and of course, you're going to have sort of stock watering. You might recall what that was. People are selling things artificially. Uh, in other words, they were saying it was worth far more than that actually was. And all this gave us a sort of a lull of confidence that was unrealistic and on october 29 it collapsed you know, people realized wait a minute the company i invested in is actually not making money so when everybody tries to sell at once we call this panic selling uh and the, the economy just collapses and you know because so much wealth evaporates it, it affects many many people in the economy not most of the economy um so here's why the depression hurt the poor uh unemployment is directly connected to purchasing power. If if you have unemployment, you can't purchase stuff. This is why the federal government just this past month sent out trillions of dollars to us Americans. You know, I got my check in the mail for for not working. You know, uh, but because that was the idea that we would continue to buy stuff. We continue to buy stuff, then businesses will stay afloat. Thus, people will continue to work. But if people aren't working, you're making less stuff. You need fewer people unemployment rises and the cycle downward and so this we got into a downward cycle that we couldn't get out of um and really it was devastating one fourth the american people are poor uh for the working class people who could work so our economy and from then on really is based on buying stuff uh not savings you have to have high demand uh and without it you know without demand increase and here he's talking about technological innovation of both electricity and machinery, but uh, they didn't create particularly new jobs. Now, you could be a like a machine repair man, but there weren't that many of those. Um, and, and so really overproduction is pretty much the cause of every major, major panic, overproduction, overspeculation. So, and then the other problem that's really, it's not completely new to American history. We've always had divisions of wealth, uh, you know, but it's the fact that such a small percentage of, of people owned a great deal of the American wealth. Uh, as you can see here, the bottom 42% of Americans had the same amount as one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans, and that 42% were below the poverty line. So when you think about FDR, these are the forgotten men that he's talking about. This 42% of Americans, here you can see if it's in pink, and of course you might notice that's predominantly African-American, uh, but you know these are children below poverty level. And this is the year 2000. Uh, that's not 1930. Um, so if you look here, 58% above the poverty line that were in the middle class, but because of the, the shrinking of the economy, they also were hurt. Their jobs were based on the factory working so that they could be teachers or accountants or, you know, librarians or, you know, whatever the middle class people were, and, and they're going to get squeezed too. So in the end, when their salaries are cut, the other uh, folks' productivity decline. And so at the end, everything, it just consumption in general evaporates if people aren't spending money anymore because there is none. So if you ever asked a question about prices and, and how much stuff cost during the Depression, it was cheap uh, because nobody was buying anything. Now, Hoover didn't, Hoover didn't come out and save the day. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why he's very unpopular. 
uh, Hoover says, you know, hey, look, I, I'm going to help businesses who will cooperate. And so here you see voluntary, non-coercive. You get a tax break if you start investing some of your money. But, you know, it's no good to have a tax break if, you're, if your business goes out of business. So many companies did not do this. They didn't take advantage of it. Meanwhile, the Europeans can't pay back banks that owed, that were owed money. So Hoover finally says, you know what, let's just put a stop to this. This guy Young had tried to negotiate a $26 billion payoff to uh, the U.S. over basically 60 years. And that's what this, this is a German poster. Uh, for three generations, you have to slave away. But Hoover in 31 says, well, that, that's not going to work. And so he doesn't even require, he says, you know, you don't have to pay off the debt and reparations. But by then it's too late. You, you guys do understand that had he done this in 28, life might have been a whole lot better, or 29, I should say. But uh, he did it after the Depression, and so no good there. Okay? Particularly since if they're going to buy our stuff, we definitely don't need to be raising tariffs. Uh, and, and that's exactly what we did. We raised tariffs rather than lower them. Political you know, tariffs were always something the Republican Orthodox, the Republican belief was you raise tariffs, it'll help U.S. industry. And, and, and this this is finally the point in history where this sort of traditional uh, conventional wisdom is going to be shattered. Raising tariffs does not promote consumption. Uh, and, and so it didn't. You know, American companies did not start getting stimulated by this uh, because we were in a global economy uh, and had been really since before World War One. And so, you know, trade does not grow and doesn't exist really during the Depression. Meanwhile, the Soviets didn't help anybody out by what we would call today dumping. They dumped uh, a ton of cheap wheat, well, tons of cheap wheat, which undercut American farmers. Uh, and they were trying to get money back, pay back German bankers who also weren't getting paid. So German banks tried to borrow from us and the banks had just got wiped out. So bank, just imagine all the banks in the world just about collapsing. I would point out that the Depression really seriously affects the industrialized world. The, you know, the third world doesn't, third world's already impoverished, so they're not going to get much more impoverished during this. Um, so how do we treat Hoover? Well, he is to blame, we believe. Now, I do not blame Hoover for, for this solely. I don't think he saved us from it. Uh, but, you know, what Hoover's problem was, he was too slow, if, if you believe this a problem, he's too slow to, to actually give assistance to individuals. This is certainly going to be his problem in the election of 20, uh, in the election of 32, because FDR is going to get elected on a campaign basically of directly helping the individual. Uh, and he was concerned, like Coolidge and others, that any sort of government interference with people would be, you know, this traditional sense of the individual. If you, if you think back to the Emerson essay on self-reliance or the historic narrative of the American pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. And if the government has to send him a check, well, yeah, that ain't pulling himself up. You know, that's, Let's get a handout. And, and Hoover was very much opposed to that. He did create one thing that, that sort of gets overlooked. Uh, and I do want y'all to recall the RFC. Uh, the RFC was a federal agency. It's a, it says corporation, but in reality, it's a federal uh, chartered corporation. And it can make money available to banks. Um, uh, but, you know, the idea of loaning money to banks at a time where it appeared that banks caused a depression was not popular at all amongst the American public. And so he's 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 not going to be seen as the great liberator of, of the economy. But he does do baby steps. And I think if Hoover hadn't done this, FDR would have had a lot harder time doing the new deal. He, um, he, he sends federal money out to build some infrastructure. And, of course, we mentioned the RFC for banks. He does most famously do a public works program called the Hoover Dam. You're looking at it here, uh, the Hoover Dam, which is a, you know, a really massive uh, uh, structure for hydroelectricity and for water, uh, uh, control water in the Arizona area. Um, and there was a law passed by a New Yorker, uh, Pierre LaGuardia, uh, who said that unions would not be broken up um, using federal law. Uh, and you may recall the yellow dog contract which prohibited union membership. So in other words, unions weren't going to be prosecuted as, as uh, destruction of labor. So there are some minor gains, sort of pre-New Dealish stuff by the Republican Party here, public leadership, but it's a little too late. Uh, and so in the end, it doesn't go to satisfy the American workers. And, and a group that really is upset are American veterans. Um, veterans of World War one of the things Congress does during this period is they cut 
the bonuses that they had voted in favor of in the 1920s. Now, I would argue that if they not voted these extra bonuses, then they probably wouldn't have ever had to cut them later. So that's one of those things where it seems like Harding and Coolidge probably were right in a sense. But nonetheless, these were promises made to veterans of World War I. Uh, and then they got cut. And so they marched on Washington. This is one of those first really six, sort of large scale marches on Washington and not in success at all. But, uh, you know, it's kind of on the scale of, um, well, in numbers, it's comparable to something like uh, the, you know, the Women's March in, in, in 19, uh, well, Wilson's March, I guess you'd say, that, the, the Women's Suffrage Rally. And then, of course, later the March on Washington in general in the 1950s, uh, 60s. So anyway, you, you see here these veterans show up and they're demanding their pensions. And uh, Hoover, I think, again, doesn't intend for what happens to happen, but he sends in the army, uh, interesting enough, commanded by Generals MacArthur, General Eisenhower, and they they physically disperse the bonus army. And some of these veterans are killed and the fires are set down to, to the little shanties, the so-called Hoover Bills. And so, you know, this is a really unfortunate event. And Hoover, and one more black, sort of, one more stain, so to speak, on his administration. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Japan is is not reeling from the depression like much of the rest of the world, uh, and they're going to use this opportunity to seize more of of Asia continentally. You know, Japan is going to invade Manchuria and establish a puppet state. That means a state run by a uh, you know a, a man loyal to their leadership, and it's actually the former emperor of China, Hirohito, is the emperor of Japan. And this is Henry Puyi, and he'll be like the sort of emperor of Manchu Kuo, but answered directly to Hirohito uh, or to Tojo, more likely. You can see here, Japan has already taken over Korea, and now they've taken over Manchuria. And they're going to be progressing down, and you can see who's in the neighborhood. It's the U.S. down here in the Philippines. We're right here, and here's Japan, Japan's you know territory. So they're going to see us as a natural rival, us the French, here's Indochina, and this is all British territory here. So the Brits, the French, and the U.S., who, by the way, theoretically at least, have democracy, um, here comes Japan. So these are going to be our, our sort of enemies if you're the Japanese. The League says, Japan, how dare you do this? How dare you invade a country and, and take over? And, uh, uh, Japan's like, well, because we can. And they leave the League, and, and the League, again, does nothing uh, to stop this. Uh, you know, President Hoover's like, I, I ain't touching this with 10-foot pole. That being said, he does uh, make a statement, and it's through our Secretary of State, Secretary Stimson, uh, the Stimson Doctrine, it's called. Uh, we will not recognize any forcefully acquired territory. Japan said, well, how dare you, since you guys are in the business of acquiring territory forcefully yourselves. Uh, and so Japan is then going to invade the rest of China, at least eastern mainland China. Uh, and, you know, Hoover consistently with his, his sort of isolationist says, uh, besides the Stimson Doctrine, so we won't recognize you, you know, there really wasn't much else done, but he does say the troops that we had sent down to Latin America need to come home. So last thing we need to do is get involved in a Latin American conflict. So this is going to be what FDR later dubs the good neighbor policy. Okay, so that takes us through, uh, through Hoover uh, and sets the stage for sort of a, a landmark legislation excuse me, landmark election, huge election, uh, and this is the election of, of FDR. You know, this is, now, there are a lot of reasons why FDR gets elected, um, and, and obviously Hoover is not popular at all. Uh, he wins a handful of New England states and Pennsylvania, and, and really FDR is, is a, a cruising victory, 472 to 59 in electoral college. So when, when FDR comes in, well, we're not going to talk about the New Deal in this, this presentation, but, but when he comes in, he... He's created a, a program of, of managed currency, which means he wants to, you know, control the the costs, uh, or he wants to inflate the currency, to put it bluntly. He wants to increase, he takes us off the gold standard. He wants to see the amount of money in, in America be able to buy more stuff. Uh, so he's going to inflate the, the economy. And, and because of that, there was an attempt, a global attempt, really, called the LEC, or an economic conference, try to keep exchange rates comparable around the world, FDR is not having any of it. Uh, at the same time, you know, we realized that the Philippines were not really good for us. After all, they're expensive. Uh, and we say, we're going we're gonna to grant you your independence. And maybe if we'd gone ahead and done it in 33, life would have been a different story. But instead, we're still in, in the Philippines when, when Pearl Harbor gets attacked. Um, 
FDR is going to make a fateful decision to do something that neither Wilson, nor Harding, nor Coolidge, nor Hoover had done, and that is to recognize that the legitimate government of Russia is the Soviet Union. So he says, uh, we need sort of friends in case the Japanese and the Germans start to get hostile with us. So we'll try to recognize the Soviets as an official country, maybe even trade with them a little bit. We ultimately don't. So he says, ready to buy half a billion dollars worth of goods, and, and we didn't. Um, and, and really, one of the things that makes this move highly unpopular is once sort of World War II is over, we're going to start something called uh, the Cold War. This is the great bugaboo of the Cold War, and he really was a ruthless dictator. Uh, he employed secret police. He's a communist. Uh, you know, he massacred millions of his own people. But, you know, in a, in a sort of world of global politics, geopolitics, he's the enemy of our enemy, so to speak. So Stalin, definitely need to know him. Bad guy. But, uh, you know, he's a bad guy against the bad guys that were a bigger threat to us at the moment. And, and students are often confused. Like, how come we're good guys with the Soviets? And, and we weren't. FDR never approved of this stuff down here. But sometimes, you know, situations dictate strange bedfellows. Uh, that's who we're friends with. Meanwhile, I just alluded to this. FDR is going to create something called the good neighbor policy. This is a direct rejection of old cousin TR. And he's saying, hey, man, we're, we need to be on the same boat. We need to be good friends, good neighbors, because, heck, there are a whole lot of of, of enemies abroad who might come over here, uh, fascist aggressors, uh, and, and try to take over territory in the Western Hemisphere. So he's really, he runs as a candidate and governs initially as a non-interventionist. We're not going to get involved in the rest of the world's affair. We're going to kind of keep to ourselves. Now, we don't like what some of the bad guys around the world are doing, but we don't want to try to you know, muddle the waters, or muddy the waters with that. I would dedicate our country to being a good neighbor, a neighbor who resolutely respects both ourselves and our neighbors, he respects the rights of others, all right? Neighbor who respect his obligations and the sanctity of his agreements. That's FDR. Now, mentioned this before, uh, under President uh, uh, Hoover and even Harding, excuse me, Coolidge, uh, we were beginning to see the, the power of tariffs moving away from Congress. They're going to give up the power basically here and, and give it to the president almost unilaterally, where he can personally do this. Uh, without congressional approval. And so this is where we are now. Today, presidents can raise or lower tariffs with, uh, you know, without congressional enactment. Um, and, and at the same time, you can lower tariffs, particularly if other countries reciprocally lower their tariffs, which is what they do. You also had an a, a investigation run by a Senate committee that, that really want to know why did we get involved in World War One? It seems really, uh, afterwards, it just seems like we, we fought for something that was, was not valuable. We, we didn't make the world safer democracy. We didn't, we didn't end all wars. So what was the point? And Nye's conclusion, his committee's conclusion, is that the reason we fought World War One was so that gun and weapons manufacturers could make big profits and bankers could make big profits lending money. Now, keep in mind, he's a senator from North Dakota, tend to be more isolationist part of the country tend to distrustful bankers and things like that. But he is a Republican. Uh, and he says that Wilson had pulled us into war by letting countries' uh, ships sail into, um, letting our ships sail into German and British uh, combating waters. Um, and so because of that, because Americans being in areas where we just shouldn't have been, he says, Congress is going to end up saying Americans can't go to places they're not supposed to be, uh, the neutrality act. Meanwhile, you have a law saying we are not going to loan money anybody who owed us money and you, know, you remember in 1931 the moratorium uh well now basically except for finland that says we're not gonna be able to loan any money to anybody so pretty pretty you know head in the sand isolation sometimes called so the key things you need to recall about the neutrality act and they're a big feature of the interwar period in the 30s we're not going to sell weapons we're not going to give loans and we're not going to travel anywhere where bad people or countries are fighting each other this, of course, is going to exclude the Spanish as well because they're fighting even if they're the good guys. Um, but basically, we're going to say we're not going to be involved uh, in your problems. You know, we're going to stay out of that. Okay, so kind of turning our our back on this work of you know, the looming storm clouds over Europe. Uh, I don't want to go over there. Um, and so there are sort of hallmarks of this. You should recall that we're giving up something we fought a, uh, really two wars for. World War I and World War, uh, and the War of 1812, where we should be able to sail our vessels anywhere if we're not at war, and now we're saying we won't. We, in a period of the 30s, when we should have been building up the military, 
arguably declined it. And, you know, we don't say there's such thing as bad guys and good guys. It's just they're all bad guys. And this is this is a debatable point. Like if America's Switzerland, all of this is well too bad. You know, this is the price of being neutral. But if, if we're going to be the world's superpower, then, you know, are these things that we should be doing? Uh, and, and with that, you see the rise of the fascists. Now, technically, Mussolini had been in there since the early 20s. But it's by the 30s that he sort of really solidifies his authority and invades Ethiopia. Uh, and the invasion of Ethiopia is not stopped by the League. Uh, this is a fascist dictator who has risen to power, you know, promising you know, delivery and, and return to the ancient glory of Rome. Uh, and it's during that period that FDR chooses to make a public sp a speech. You know, we're not really isolation, as he says. We're not isolating ourselves completely. You know, we can't ignore the fact that it's there. Uh, and, 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 but I don't want to be involved in war. I've seen children starving. I've seen the agony of mothers and wives. I hate war. So, he, you know, he doesn't want us to be involved. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like what the Italians are doing and what the Germans and Japanese are doing. But, you know, I hate war. Keep in mind, right before an election. So really convincing. Uh, we're not going to go to war under this president. Um, but he also analogizes it after he's president, the acquisition of territory like Ethiopia or Manchuria as a, a epidemic, you know, it's an epidemic. And so we're having a quarantine. Uh, I love that, you know, relevancy today. Uh, and a quarantine of the patients to protect the health of the community. Um, it is my determination to do everything we can to avoid war. Uh, but the peace of the world, the welfare of our nation, including our own, is being threatened. So we're going to isolate ourselves. We're going to cut off that, the disease. We're not going to recognize it, and we're not going to be involved with it. So this is kind of what he's talking about, this, this event. Uh, Spain had a fascist who was getting uh, taking over the government, the Republican government. He's a military leader. Uh, and here you see that some Americans are going to go over and try to fight against this fascist, um, the Spanish Civil War. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, the fascist, Hitler and, and Mussolini, are going to deliver assistance to Franco, and he's going to win. Uh, he's going to win the Spanish Civil War, and we're not going to take a role. Meanwhile, these are the Japanese leaders you certainly should be familiar with. Uh, you know, the young Hirohito is, is really a kid. Uh, the prime minister of Japan is a full-blown militarist, but really it's the military in general. You can see by his uniform, his decoration. Um, and so they invaded China, and now they're, you know, Americans under the open door, still in China, uh, in the Yangtze River, and, and they, they bombed some of our commercial vessels and an American warship. It's called the Pan A. Uh, and they're testing to see if America will do anything about it. And, and we were, you know, angry. How dare you? And they gave FDR a, what we call it, a payment for damages and indemnity. And so, well, no more. And so, you know, with this, the war doesn't happen. You know, so, okay, cool. Uh, but it does show the Japanese that uh, these, this American country ain't going to stop us. Meanwhile, over in Europe, this guy has come to power. And you know, he is initially you know, comes to power through political means, but from the outside, he's seen as sort of an effective leader, kind of creepy, kind of scary, but clearly Germany's economy is, is running much more smoothly. But his talk about Jews and really, you know, his hateful persona is kind of frightening to the ordinary American. But again, it's, it's kind of a German problem, not really our problem. Uh, and, and we have no idea of what is about to happen in that country. Okay. So it, it's under Hitler that that Germany is going to begin the process of remilitarization, rearming, reoccupying land they lost, like the Rhineland. Uh, the fascists are going to be fighting, Mussolini particularly, going to be leading you know, groups in Spain. And, and here's where you start to see the snowball rolling downhill, if you will. Uh, Austria's Anschluss, which is the annexation by Germany of Greater Austria, the creation of a formal military alliance between Italy, Germany, and Japan, called the Axis Powers, Axis and then lastly, the takeover of a country that's not German. And that's the beginning of where you knew that Hitler was not going to be. Uh... So here's you see, here you see the prime minister of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain. He's negotiated with Hitler and claims to have peace in our time. Uh, and this is a huge uh, victory for Chamberlain politically. But, it, you know, Churchill condemns it. He says, oh, you know, this is, this is appeasement. This is capitul capitulation, giving in to the aggressive demands. So the, then the Germans, right after they do that, they take over the rest of Czechoslovakia, not just the Sudetenland, but all the rest of it. Uh, meanwhile, they form this really horrific agreement uh, that, that scares everybody. 
the Nazi Soviet non aggression pact. You know, Hitler and Stalin promised to not fight each other. And in fact, they agreed to divide up Poland, which is you know what they do. Uh, September the first, they invade Poland. You can see the, the body of Poland strewn. Uh, and Poland is very quickly cut up. Now that's when America starts to really wake up. Uh, we're like, hey, wow, they're gonna take over Europe and we're not doing anything. So FDR gets Congress to, to move in a session and create what we now know as cash and carry. So the 1939 Neutrality Act said, hey, if you come over here with cash, we'll actually sell you weapons. So for the first time, we're gonna be manufacturing weapons, um, cash and carry. Uh, the president says this is a danger zone. You can't sell your ships there. We're not going to have uh, a Lusitania or a, um, you know, if, if you think back to the Sussex Pledge, there are not going to be any more areas where Americans are in danger. And so, you know, only people who could get money from us or weapons from us were the Allies, particularly the Brits, lesser degree Russians, and and slowly start to help the American economy slowly. Uh, and we begin the process. I should say America begins becoming the arsenal. We don't really become the arsenal until Lynn lease. But then the war kind of stops. Hitler has invaded Poland uh, and taken it over. And Europeans are not in a position to really fight. Plus, it's wintertime. Uh, and so you have a different war, uh, in a sense, the Winter War. The, the Finns will fight against the Soviets. Uh, but in the spring of 40, Hitler resumes operations, seizing Denmark and Norway. Uh, and then, you know, it's clear that Chamberlain has been ineffective. He will be voted out by his own party and in place a, a very, very militant leader who's sort of been preaching the danger of Hitler all the time, Sir Winston Churchill. So Churchill expects that uh, the war will be fought by the Brits and the French here, uh, you know, in this area. And, of course, the, the hope is that the Maginot Line will be effective. This proved to be utterly ineffective. Uh, and Churchill and uh, the French are overwhelmed by, uh, and really stunned by the, the speed in which Hitler's tank divisions move through Belgium, uh, lightning fast. This is Hitler's blitzkrieg at its very best. He takes into France. Uh, this is the miracle at Dunkirk. They had surrounded the Brits and the, uh, you know, trapped them in a small, uh, a small corridor. Uh, they were ultimately able to evacuate. Think again, the miracle at Dunkirk. Uh, but France will fall. Uh, France will be defeated in one month. Uh, and this is stunning. And this is really the first time America's like, uh, well, not the first first. I, this is the time that when even ordinary Americans begin to wake up and say, wait a minute, you know, the, you know, the cash and carry is one thing, but now it looks like they're going to take over all of Europe without firing hardly any shots. I mean, that's, that's the Eiffel Tower, for God's sake. So we, you see here two things that are very important. One is that FDR gets appropriations for money to spend money, $37 billion to build up the military. Keep in mind, this is as late as 1940. America does not have a military. So from 1919 to 1940, basically our military had been reduced to almost nothing. So we have to refill it uh, with a million people drafted every year. And he flies down to Cuba to talk it out with the Latin American countries to make sure that we're all in agreement that the fascists aren't going to come over here. So we're, we're, if we're not on a war footing, we're on a preparation for war footing. Um, and of course you have this terrible, terrible bombing campaign against the British population, uh, the British air force, RAF it's called, whoops, uh, the RAF at, will, um, We'll be fighting against the uh, German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, uh, and they're going to battle it out in the skies above Britain for the better part of four months. Um, and in the end, uh, the Germans are going to fail. But, but, but meanwhile, Britain's major cities and towns look like this, just absolutely annihilated. It looks like kind of civil war land. The Blitz, it's called. But Churchill will come on the radio and be one of the great leaders of that, that, that medium uh, and speak to the German, I mean, the British people, excuse me, and talks about uh, how, you know, we will never give up. We will never surrender. And, and how was so many was owed by so much was owed by so many to so few. Very famous. Keep calm and carry on while people stayed in the underground. But over here, the argument has become much more heated politically. Uh, you, you can see here there was a, as a recent. Uh, HBO miniseries called The Plot Against America, I think it was, but in it they feature Lindbergh as sort of a fascist president of the United States. Uh, and so here it's like a debate. Now, Lindbergh wasn't an overt fascist. He he was sympathetic of uh, the Germans far more so than what I think is uh, appropriate. 
but you know, uh, you had this debate about the best way to defend America was to you know keep America first, not to to get involved in European events. The America first, but it was directly in conflict debate wise with the Committee to Defend America by the Allies. Everything short of going to war, uh, and so uh, you know, Lindbergh would go across the country and give speeches, and he and FDR were really personally. Uh, having animosity towards each other. And, and FDR is going to draw us closer to war. Uh, he wants to help Churchill. We can't give him money effectively because uh, Churchill doesn't have any more money and we won't, we won't do loans to countries at war, military, I mean, uh, financial loans. So instead, he gives uh, Churchill's Navy 50, the Brits Navy, 50 old destroyers. Uh, these are old steamship destroyers uh, in exchange for all these cool, cool you know, naval bases. So it's called destroyers for bases. It takes us one step closer. Clearly says we're buddies with the Brits by this point. If Hitler hadn't had any, any doubt. Now we have an election, uh, and FDR at this point is hugely popular for two reasons. One is because the New Deal seems to be going pretty well. It hasn't solved the depression outright, but he's certainly helping the, the forgotten man. Uh, and he's also campaigning as uh, the American who will not send your your boys into foreign wars. So we'll, he'll keep us out of war, for like Woodrow Wilson had. Wilkie, uh, decent guy, nice candidate for president, just uh Basically ran a, you know, FDR shouldn't be president campaign. You know, he shouldn't break the break the, the two-term tradition kind of thing. So, you know, that, that's about it. <laughs> so he really couldn't come. I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but the, not a really strong campaign. Now, as soon as uh, the election was over, he then proceeds, FDR, to, and gets elected, obviously, uh, to say, you know, people keep talking, particularly like Senator Bob Taft, People keep talking about that foolish old dollar sign. Like, we can't give money to the Europe, to the Brits. That's silly. Their house is on fire. We have something we can give them. Uh, and the something we can give them uh, are, are these, are, are airplanes uh, and, and you know, tanks and, and arms. So let's do that. You know, let's give them that so that the fight doesn't have to come over here. The fire doesn't have to spread to our house, so to speak, because the garden hose speech, so uh, it's often said. And actually, it's not a speech. He gives us to some reporters who are sitting around in the White House with him talking. Uh, this is his State of the Union in, in January of 1941. And in it, he says, and this is interesting, he uses, his, and this, of course, the poster is Norman Rockwell, very famous artist. But he uses the, the, the opportunity of this to believe that everywhere around the world, people are, are guaranteed these freedoms. So it's kind of like a very enlightenment sort of philosophy. Freedom of expression. So that's, that's speech and press and assembly. Freedom of religion, freedom from wants. That's you know freedom from poverty. If you think about what that means, uh, and freedom from fear. Contextually, this is sort of the how the New Deal should be everywhere. Uh, you know, kind of remaking the world. Uh, and so here's this most noteworthy thing. So if you're thinking about it in context, we go from 35, 36, and 37 neutrality acts, 39 cash and carry, 40 destroyers for ba uh, uh, bases deal, and now 41 the Lend Lease Act. And, and the Lindley's Act is where we completely abandon any pretext, a uh, pretense rather, of neutrality. Fifty billion dollars worth of weapons and equipment uh, to the Allies, um, and you can see here: uh, Britain, Soviets, France, China, and this is nationalist China. Uh, you know, so billions of dollars that are going to be sent to help the Allies, just short of going to war itself. Now, this is where our debate was in, in you know, barbershops and the diners. And we had this discussion as Americans. This is what democracy is supposed to be. Should we be an isolationist country? Should we be an internationalist country? And, uh, you know, as the results of this law indicate, America wanted to become involved just short of fighting directly. Uh, we definitely take the side of the allies. We're not neutral anymore. And we began gearing up our factories away from the New Deal and towards war production, so the making of tanks and planes and jeeps. Now, at this point, the Nazis, the Germans, start sinking American vessels, uh, or attacking them, if not outright sinking them. And so here you see the Robin Moore is targeted. This is a, a sub-warfare target. Um, and, and you know, here FDR pretty much sums it up. If we were to give in to this, uh, you know, we would submit to world domination. So he's drawing a line in the sand. Meanwhile, Hitler has failed to take Britain and he's going to make his terrible blunder of invading the Soviet Union. Now, while that's going on, there's a secret meeting between FDR and Churchill off the coast of Newfoundland. And in it, they discuss, what do we want to do after the war is over? <laughs> but, you know, once we win, this is what we're going to do. And, of course, these are not publicized. But if you ever want to find a document that stands for what the, you know, the 
U.S. and British government at least felt was proper and really their obligation of the New World Order, this is it. But this was not something they campaigned on or ran to the American people or the British people. It was just sort of like an agreement behind the scenes. And it was the first time these two guys met during the war personally, you know, and it was done in secret at the time. Now, after it was over, it was publicized. But so after we began arming our Lend Lease, remember Lend Lease as you come over here, the Brits couldn't send ships over here to get our planes and get our stuff as much. And so we start sending warships to, to, to escort them and they get attacked. But the convoys get attacked. You can see here the Carney has a hole inside of it uh, where it was torpedoed right there. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, let's see, several of these ships, are, the, the Reuben James, most noteworthy, uh, is going to be sunk. This is the Reuben James here. And with the sinking of the Reuben James by July of 41, uh, it's pretty clear that we're going to be at war with Germany at some point in the near future. Uh, meanwhile, out in the Pacific, we've been slowly taking away some of the ships to arm the Atlantic destroyers for bases deal. Uh, and the Japanese believe that, you know, we're their potential out, uh, enemy, excuse me. We had already passed a law basically embargoing all kinds of stuff that, that would, Japan would need, including oil, scrap metal, fuel, machinery. And so the Japanese expect that, that we're going to be their enemy. And so they come up with a plan to surprise attack the U.S. Uh, here you see they had snuck photographs. They knew exactly where Battleship Row was. Uh, here they are flying in where they can see the, the warships straight from the planes. This is the Arizona, the ship that was destroyed entirely uh, in, its, in its midship uh, and sank um, almost 3,000 Americans aboard. Uh, most famous picture that emerged at the time, that's the explosion of one of the oil uh, storage facilities. And so with that, uh, we have the, the outbreak of, of World War II. FDR will famously sign the agreement uh, the next day. The Declaration of War, asked for by Congress. Uh, like I said, almost 3,000 Americans will be killed in that first attack. And so our next set of notes would involve World War II, and I uh, hope that makes good sense.